David Fraser, are you here? David, David, we were talking beforehand about 23 years ago when we were on a trip. I went to Australia to open an office for MoneyWeb. In, in fact, we went to go and do a deal. I was doing a deal which never came off, but we opened an office in Perth. And Sean Summers was in the process at Pick and Pay back then of showing us all, I, I just hitchhiked on your, on your analyst trip to uh, Franklin's. And it was very interesting. I met David there and we still know each other quite well now. I got to know you quite well then. Uh, Sean and I have um, kept in touch over the years. I don't know if it's fair to actually start with this question, Sean, but you are in the hometown of Marcus Yoster. Marcus who? <laughs> okay, we'll leave it at that. Sean is 70 years old, and that's really irrelevant. What is relevant, though, is that he's gone back into the fire and he has taken over the company that was number one when he was running it, when David uh, and I were on a trip to go and have a look at the Australian interests. And he's now gone straight back into the fray. And the obvious question, short, obvious question is, it looks like it's in a lot of trouble. If you'd known pick and pay was as badly off before you accepted the job, would you have actually come out of retirement? You know, Alec, for a smart man, one pulled part of cautionary and closed period. Don't you understand? No, 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 no. So just I'll set that as a backdrop. Just set that as a backdrop. So I just need to be very, uh, very guarded in what I say yeah, this evening in all, in all seriousness. Um, I mean, the genesis in coming back to pick and pay was that um, I kept a close relationship with Raymond and Wendy post my departure from pick and pay. And Raymond and I would see each other at least once a year, twice a year, and have a cup of tea. And when I saw Raymond in May last year um, in the gardens at the Mistral at their home, which was still the same home that they lived in basically for his entire time at pick and pay, um, I knew it was the last time I would see the old man alive, basically. And uh, when I came back to pay my respects to him in September, uh, Wendy and Gareth reached out to me and prevailed upon me and asked me, please, wouldn't I come back and uh, <clears throat> have a look at pick and pay? And uh, obviously, I mean, it's common cause that the company had fallen on hard times. And um, I did. So I said to Wendy, I would. And I think that in life, you do what you do. I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for them. My family wouldn't have what they've got if it wasn't for them. So I think in life, you owe debts of gratitude and you fulfill them. Where did the story start? Where did, where did it start with pick and pay? How did you Me. end up getting in there? Um, at the age of 20, I joined pick and pay as a trainee manager. Um, my first job was at Shell BP Service Company in 1973. I had a dream then that I wanted to get into computers, if you can believe it. In fact, the largest IBM installation in the Southern Hemisphere was in that gray BP building on the foreshore on the 16th and 17th floor. Uh, never mind the iPhone, the Apple Watch does 10 times what that thing does today. And then they had the first oil crisis at the end of 73. And being an impatient young man, I just decided to hell with it, I'm out of here. And um, I joined Pick and Pay as a trainee manager. And in January 1974, I left Cape Town in my little mini and I drove to Port Elizabeth. Best thing that ever happened to me, I met Lorna there. I found my wife there, my daughter was born there. So that's where it started in Port Elizabeth as a trainee. And some 20 years later, I ended up as a managing director of the retail business. And then a few years after that, Raymond handed over to me as CEO. So I was the first CEO after Raymond. He handed the keys to me. And I was blessed. I had an extraordinary, extraordinary life. What does a trainee at Pick and Pay in the 70s do? <clears throat> you started on the back door, produce department. You started on receiving initially. 
And uh, there's actually a beautiful story because you mentioned the story about the other fellow that lives here in Amanus. And there was the famous time where he actually wanted uh, to do a deal with, uh, <clears throat> with Christo, who's talking day after tomorrow. And they had this famous meeting where Christo organized this, uh, this meeting with himself and Marcus and Yanni Maton and Whitey Basson. And uh, at this meeting, Marcus is waxing forth about all of the virtues of retail. And eventually, Whitey couldn't control himself anymore. And he proceeded to explain to Marcus how little he knew about retail and also about how long it took to create a store manager. That, you know, you start off in receiving, you learn how to count boxes, then you go to fruit and veg, then you go to the bakery, then you go to the deli, then you go to the cheese shop. And eventually, when he finished this whole long story, Christo took him, at least Whitey, Took him a good few minutes in hyperventilating to explain to Marcus how long it took to like one store manager. There was silence in the room, and Yanni Maton famously asked the question of Whitey. He said, Whitey, can you get it's for our So he said, sure. So he said, have you ever tried employing a clever person? So, uh, <laughs> you know, it's, um, <clears throat> it is basically the haunt of retail. And I mean, you know, retail is really, it's, uh, it's a very different business because it is not the haunt of academics. It's a highly repetitive business. It's a high contact business. It's a high grind business. And you really, really ought to look after it intensely. And I can't use this analogy anymore now that I'm back in retail, but I always used to say, it's pretty much like driving a car. You can't take your hands off the wheel for a second and it leaves the road. So uh, I started as a training manager, worked my way through and basically did all of the departments across pick and pay in PE, then went to East London when we were, opened our stores there, back to PE, back to Cape Town and the hypermarkets, went to Boxburg hypermarket, I was national buyer for food in the hyper division, then I went to Australia in 85, when we opened the hypermarket there, I spent about 10 months there, and uh, back here onto the board on food, then eventually MD of uh, the retail business, and then eventually Raman appointed me chief executive officer, and uh, I had the last 10 years of my career at Pick and Pay uh, as CEO was the most, just most extraordinary journey. And I consider myself to be a very lucky fellow. And that's why I'm back. You know, I asked Muzi this afternoon about leaving Parliament and going back again. It's five years for him. People still remember Muzi Maimani for the time. As I've mentioned in the polls that you ask of the most popular politician, he's still number two. People still associate Sean Summers with pick and pay. How many years has it been since you, you've gone? God, I think it's 17 or 18 now uh, in total. Yeah, 17 or 18 years. So it's quite tough being back at this age. You know, you need a nap after lunch. It gets a bit sort of... Uh, <laughs> very good. <laughs> so, so yeah, no, no. It's fantastic being back. I must say, I mean, you know, you look certainly you don't maybe look that or well, don't feel that way when you look in the mirror. But I mean, I feel as energized today as I did 30 years ago. Um, when I have a look around the company and I look at the 92,000 people that work for us, and you look at the responsibility that you have at the end of the day, I mean, these are, these are livelihoods, these are families, these are people. And when you look at the whole infrastructure that hangs off the company and uh, all of our service providers, all of our suppliers, everybody, uh, you have... You just have a monster role to play in society, a huge role to play in society. And the other thing about retail, Alex, is everybody knows what you do. Um, you know, I'm a little bit friendly with uh, Bruce Cleaver, who's a shareholder in a game launch that we have in Medipa. And Bruce is very fortunate. I mean, he's managing director of De Beers. Fortunately, my wife is partial to what he does. But uh, I don't know what Bruce does for a living. One thing I know sure as hell, he don't go to that hole in Kimberley and scratch around the stones. Uh, they know what I do. They go to the stores and they can see what happened. And that's why what we do is on show for all. Everybody can see it. So when we're feeling the pain that we feel now, everybody can feel our pain and everybody can see our pain. But it doesn't make the challenge. It's suppose in a way it makes it a little bit more daunting, but does it make you want to walk away from it? Hell no. Uh, in fact, it inspires you even more uh, when you see the people around and the task that lies ahead. Have, have the, has the training program at Pick and Pay changed much from when you were being trained? Because the, the way you explained it to us, 
Uh, it seems like the right thing to do in any business. People start at the bottom, work their way through, and then you you know where the bodies are hidden, and you also know which nuts need to be tightened. You know, again, uh, for fear of not saying anything that I shouldn't be saying in this period that we're in now, um, I think it's certainly some of the the fiber of the company and the fuel of the company has diminished. And, you know, ours is a human business at the end of the day. And I think it, life is quite simple. You know, you cannot. And this is something that my father taught me from the time that I can remember, that he says you just get two kinds of people in life. Those who want to take out more and those who want to leave stuff behind. And I think that people are the same. If you're prepared to put more into your people than you want back out of them, there's no end to what you get. And it's not a mercenary commercial transaction. It's not a binary thing. If your people know that you are there for them and that you absolutely support them, everything works on that. After you left, there were a lot of investment analysts, okay, and take it from whence it comes, who were very un who, who believed that you left because of the, f of the dynamics of a family-owned company. Now, I'm quite partial to family-owned companies after the experiences I've had. What is your view on family-owned companies? Can you, be, can you kind of unpack for us what it's like to be working for them again? Now, I think it's a family-controlled a family controlled company uh, and owned company is a beautiful thing because at least you are dealing with something that has substance and soul and not just an amorphous bunch. And your shareholders are very, very important. But when you're just dealing with an amorphous bunch of shareholders out there, you are either in or out for a period. They have a view in the company. Yeah, this is maybe a one, a two, or a three-year view. At least you know when you're dealing with the family, you've got people that have a long-term view of what the company looks like. And uh, from that perspective, it was extraordinary. I mean, I could go and sit in Raymond's office and float ideas after him, and you would talk about it, and he would say, fine, I'm backing you, go. And it was done. You know, he didn't have to go anywhere else. The power was there. So it was it was extraordinary. It was extraordinary. And now that Raymond has passed, do you sit in Gareth's office? Gareth and I have actually just changed offices. Uh, Gareth has actually moved to Raymond's office. Um, and I moved into Gareth's office. And, uh, you know, it's just, I suppose in a way, it's a little bit sort of, uh, the first day I walked into the building after 17, 18 years, I didn't quite know my way around as much as I used to. But you soon orientate yourself, and then you realize still that there are extraordinary people. They're just extraordinary people. And you know, on Monday, I had tea with Gareth and Wendy on Monday. And, um, I was, and Wendy was just asking the question about the people in the company, coming back to your question. And she was saying, Sean, you know, how are you finding people in the organization? And I said, you know, Wendy, we've got still extraordinary people in the company. Sure, we've got some people playing out of position. Because that's what happens in organizations when they go through stress and you've got a shortage somewhere and you say, I've got, an, I've got a need here. And then Jill or John puts their hand up and they say, I'll do it. And they arrive in the job and within three or four months, you work out that they're actually in the wrong place and you actually end up hurting the people. And I said to Wendy, we've got some people playing out of position. So yeah, I had to move a bit of cheese in December. In fact, I had to move a lot of people's cheese, but that goes with the turf. But it's a case in getting people back in position where they really play at their best. And here yeah, is the simple truth. And I said this to Wendy. I said, you know, last time when we built Pick and Pay up to what it was, it was getting ordinary people to achieve the extraordinary every day. Because none of us are special. We all put on our pants exactly the same way in the morning, one leg at a time. And it doesn't matter whether you're putting on your pants or your knickers, or today you've got to be politically correct. It may be both but it's still one leg at a time. And that's what life is. It's about giving people belief, about pointing people in a direction, getting people to buy into what it is that it does, and importantly, that they understand that as your leader, you've got their back. That if they fail, they've got to fail and learn fast and move on. But failure in and of itself is part of the cycle of learning. You've mentioned Wendy a few times. How involved is she this is, those who don't know, this is Raymond Ackerman, the founder of Pick and Pay, his wife. How involved is she in the business? Um, I mean, I'm just, I mean, I was, obviously I'm very sensitive to Wendy because, you know, Raymond sadly passed at the end of the last year, her lifelong partner. 
I always said to people in the company, one of the great examples was Raymond and Wendy. I mean, they truly did walk together and create an extraordinary organization together. And I feel a pain for having used Raymond. I mean, it's a, it's a very, very hard thing at that stage of your life to lose your partner like that. And then for a company to be under the stress that it's under. So, you know, supporting her and Gareth and the rest of the family, as I say, I consider it my duty to do it uh, because I would not be, and I repeat it again, I would not be who I am if it wasn't for them. Clearly their passion, the business, and bringing you back in after you departed so long ago must have been a huge decision for the family as well. Did they ever share with you why? And not, I mean, not that intimately. I mean, it, uh, A, I think it's, uh, it's an honor at this stage to be asked to come back. And uh, as you say, I mean, the challenge is significant that's there, but we will deal with it. Yeah, we will, we will move the boat forward faster. Um, you know, it's like a famous coach at, at, at Oxford and Cambridge. They were trying to work out how Coach Stevens every year, every year Cambridge was just winning. And they had a simple philosophy in the team when they went and doled down. And every single thing they did in the team was purely to make the boat go faster. So if anybody came with a smart idea, they were said, but is it going to make the boat go faster? And that is our simple mantra in Pick and Pay today. Everything that we focus on today is about making the boat go faster while we deal with a lot of the other challenges that we're dealing with at the moment. But I think on the Pick and Pay topic, time X. Yeah. Your approach, and it's broad stuff, because these are really good business lesson, lessons. Your approach now, how, how much would it differ from the way you look at the business, from the way that you did? when? Because when you left, you're on top of the world. Now you're a challenger, or you're a long way behind. And these businesses go in cycles, Alex. I mean, uh, when I first joined Pick and Pay in 1974, I mean, OK Bazaars was forced to be reckoned with. Uh, you know, Checkers was the major supermarket chain. And then we look at this, the cyclical nature of these things. They do go through cycles. And um, I have no doubt that we will get our mojo back. We'll get our cadence back again. And we'll get back into rhythm. We'll get back into cadence. In those 17, 18 years, you went all over the world. Hmm. You worked in the UK. We saw a lot of each other there. You, you worked in the US. Is there much that you learned there? that would change your view on South African retailing. And I say this because some of your contemporaries at the time you were running Pick and Pay said that South African retailing was really good, was right up there with others in the world. Well, if you take the best of, uh, and I admire Peter Engelbrecht. In fact, I said to Whitey a while ago, he should have left a long time ago because they seem to be doing much better since he's gone. Um, this is... <laughs> I admire Peter and his team for what they're doing. I mean, they're really, they're doing a, a really spot on job today. Um, but you ask how much does retail really change at the end of the day? And, you know, if I look, I mean, I was born in 1953 in Cape Town. Obviously can't remember the specific event, but it is in my passport and my ID book. But I mean, if I think back to my sort of eight, nine, 10 years old, I mean, my mum would phone the grocery store and we lived in Palmyra Road in Newlands. And she would phone the grocery store in Ronda Bosch and the hour or two later, the fellow would arrive on a bicycle with the wicker basket and the brown paper bags full of groceries. And you'd put your milk bottles at the gate with the coupon in it or a token. I wouldn't recommend that today, but the fellow would arrive on the bicycle and you'd ask yourself the simple question, what's changed? So the app replaces that old Bakelite phone that you used to dial like this. And the scooter replaces the bicycle. But in and of itself, are we eating six times a day because of the internet? No. Are we eating different food because of the internet? No. So I think you've got to be pragmatic about not getting too wrapped around the axle on these changes that take place within the retail marketplace. And if you look at the hallmarks of great retail, and this actually pisses me off a little bit because... About five years ago, I was playing golf at Sternberg. This was in my previous life. I was playing golf at Sternberg, and I was sitting after golf the one day, and I felt these hands cover my eyes and this voice from the back saying, guess who? So I was like, you have to help me. I don't recognize the perfume. And there was 
Natasha, and I mean, Tash used to work for Investec. She was an analyst. You remember Natasha? And uh, I said to her, geez, Tash, you're looking amazing. What are you up to now? So she said, no, got my kids here. They're coming for golf at Sternberg and what have you. I've settled down. Amazing. So I said, but what are you doing? So she said, I'm working for ShopRite Checkers. So I was like, wow, you're doing industrial relations. So she said, no, no, I started an IR, but she said, no, I'm on strategy and future planning. So I said, wow, that's cool. So what are you going to do? So she says, I'm going to do what you taught me. So I said, Tash, I never taught you anything. So she said, no, no, think back in the 90s, in the sort of 96, 97 at Kyle Army, when you did that whole launch of pick and pay with the theater of foods and bringing everything on the floor and completely revolutionizing the business, all of those curated house brand ranges. She said, that's what we're going to do. So this is what pisses me off because they've taken our own playbook and played it back at us. So uh, it's a bit irritating, but here's the good news. Here's the good news. If you look at the great retailers of the world, and if you ask me who's the best supermarket in the world, for me, it's without doubt, it's Wegmans. And Wegmans operate out of Rochester. It's in the Wegman family, obviously. They're now into third generation. Uh, and the fundamentals of what they do have not changed in the last 30 years. And you know, you say we lived, we, we lived in America for a couple of years in Houston while we were looking after uh, Steinhoff's mattress business in America. And we had, <clears throat> we had a whole food store in our apartment block that we lived in in Houston. Beautiful store. And I mean, again, I watched Whole Foods grow up from virtually nothing out of Austin. Amazon bought it. And you could see literally within six, nine months, it has started to go like this. Because the merchants are leaving the business. The people that have passion are leaving the business. And you can look at any great business in the world, whether it, it doesn't matter what it's in, whether it's in supermarkets, whether it's in a restaurant, whether it's in a coffee shop, it's the people that have that love of product for what they do. They are the ones that win, and they are the ones that win perpetually. And to a degree, and I've said this when I returned, our biggest sadness was that we fell out of love basically with everything we did. We fell out of love with our people. We fell out of love with the product that we sold, and we fell out of love with the stores that we had there. And everybody knows it. You know, you can walk around in denial and say it's not like that, okay? The people sitting here in this room, I'd like to think that you all still pick and pay customers, but I'm not that naive. We'll get you back. No worry. We'll earn our spurs, and we'll get you back. And you have to earn. You have to earn your right for people to come to your store. And the one thing that I've learned Alec, it doesn't matter where you are in the world. What has changed today is that you, if you don't reward people for time, if they're going to invest in their time to come to your business and they don't leave feeling better off for the experience, if they don't feel an investment for their time, that they're infused, that they're happy, that they've smelt the coffee beans, that they've smelt the bakery, that they feel great, that they can't wait to come back, you've got a problem. And maybe that's the big difference if you go back 20 years where customers, and I don't mean in, in your case, but might have been taken more for granted. And today, time is, uh, is the most precious commodity. Yeah, it is. And I mean, we will agonize long and hard about discontinuing a supplier or severing a long-term relationship. People today are brutal. They just go, ding, delete, gone. You're not even in the consideration scale anymore. So that is the world that we live in today, and everything today is about instant. You know, I want it all, I want it now. Why are we training people to be paranoid if they don't get their tin of brick coffee inside 60 minutes? I don't know. But um, it's the cycle we're currently going through in the world, and uh, I suppose it's one of the unique things we have here in this country because we have, and in, in fact, uh, Mr. Delivery and Take A Lot were in my office this week, and we were just talking about this whole phenomenon in this country, that because we have so many people who are so desperate for work, that have scooters running around that are just trying to earn a meager little bit of money and make their lives better for their people when they get back to wherever their humble abode is that they are, that we have this phenomenon in this country where we have this high intensity delivery of groceries and displacement out of store. So that in itself is going to have some effect and some impact going forwards. So I think one needs to be cautious as to how many stores you open and exactly what they look like inside and how they merchandise. Sounds a bit like banking. 
When last did you go into a bank branch? Unfortunately, Alex, since I've been back at Pick and Pack quite regularly, because you know we've got a few, we've got a few issues at the moment. No, the dark so uh, that's uh, it's not a very, it's not a very, it's a painful question. Yeah, but a branch, no, a branch, a uh, yeah, a head off. <laughs> no. Fortunately, for the last few years, my bank has been coming to me, but it's changed a little while the last bit. But uh, we'll get over that as well. But no, it's banking has changed completely. It's all in your app. It's, I mean, cash is gone. I mean, you look in the UK today, it's cash is basically gone. Wherever you go, everything's just tap, tap. It's You go to the pub, you order a pint. Everybody's just on the phone. I mean, Revolut, you look at things like Revolut, how that's revolutionized banking. I mean, I've got this rubbish from HSBC private bank and they're giving me all of the gears. And I said, you know what? You look at all of you guys and you talk this big game and what have you. I can go to Revolut. Their product is 10 times better than yours. Because they don't have all of this massive infrastructure and historic architecture and clunky things that they have. So even the big banks are backing to keep up and change. And I think if we can spend a bit of time on this clicks and bricks kind of story, because in the restaurant game, you have dark kitchens. And if you want to Chinese food tonight, there's some dark kitchen with no brand that will make it for you, perhaps at a significant discount to what you would pay for uh, the, the branded operation. Is this not a, given the way that, that uh, the, the online side has developed, is this not a threat to people coming into the stores and to traditional retailers? It is a threat, and that's why I think, Alec, going forward, the experiential emphasis of how you run your business is going to be vitally important. I mean, you're going to Harrods today, you look at Harrods today, it's it's changed so much. I mean, you know, traditionally, if you went into the food hall compared to what it is today, a lot of it is in-store consumption. I mean, you go and have a look at what they're doing today in terms of, you know, selfridges, you go in there, there's champagne bars, there's bars all over the show, there's places you can sit down. So today, the shopping journey is about creating an experience. And the role that bricks and clicks, I mean, bricks and clicks have been around forever. And where they sort of find a meeting point at the end of the day, it's another thing that pisses me off. Uh, I mean, 20 years ago, we launched home shopping in pick and pay. 20 years ago, 22 years ago. And uh, we were there first. And even in those days, we used to talk about consumer promiscuity. And we said that customers will have a physical and a virtual life with you. And they do have a physical and a virtual life with you. So one of the challenges you have in this space is that as this business gets dislocated out of the store, and it's interesting when you start to have a look at some of the data at the kind of products that are really selling that you would order at home, so like the real sort of grudge purchase stuff like roller towels, toilet tissue, water, dishwashing liquids, washing powders, all of that kind of stuff. You know, that has great propensity for drop off at home. And that's why in your store, you have to make sure that in your bakeries, in your fish shops, in your cheese bars, in your delicatessens, in your produce areas, that you've got to be so, so on that game today. Because that is where the art of retail ultimate is going to be. And it's about having good coffee, good baristas in your stores. It's about having good availability of uh, food to consume in the stores. And I come back to it. It's all about the experience. And customers will let you know where they don't like it. So what is the store, the big and base store of the future going to look like? <clears throat> yeah. So we had another nice event this afternoon. One of our major landlords who's decided they won't be paying a dividend this year goes and sticks a pick and pay label on it. And they say that uh, <laughs> because we're concerned about pick and pay, we won't be paying a dividend next year as one of the reasons. So my phone's been going jing, jing, jing the whole afternoon. So thank you for that, Mr. Landlord. I am meeting you next week. But uh, how will the stores look at the future? You see, here's an interesting thing. If you look at the... 30, 40 years ago when the traditional supermarket was built and it was built for a direct store delivery model where the supplier delivered the goods direct to the supermarket. So you would have typically a 60-40 trading between your trading floor and your backup area to support your trading floor. Now with direct store distribution, you don't need that 40% in the back. 
The other thing that's happened as well is that old crazy month-end shopping cycle that we used to have has also flattened out now. Because with the availability of credit and plastic and funding and all of that stuff, that's also gone. So I would say that typically today, your average supermarket can most probably be about 50% of the size of what it was before. So the first thing is just from a total GLA lettable area, the supermarkets of the future are definitely going to be smaller and more compact because you just don't need it. And I think that that's going to be one of the major things. And I think that more and more going forward, you'll see less and less space being dedicated to the drudge items. So the things like your household, water, toilet tissue, all of that kind of stuff, <clears throat> I think that you will see a gradual diminishing of that space over there. And then back to the art of retail, which is really what you want to be in at the end of the day. I'm old enough to remember a time when it was viewed as certain that retailers were going to get aggressive in financial services and take banks on. Hasn't really happened. We tried. <laughs> we tried. Uh, we had the first debit card switch. In fact, when they finished, when Loader and them finished writing all of the software, uh, all of the software for SAS switch, <coughs> Pick and Pay had the first debit card switch. Um, and we try to take the banks on, but uh, it's a difficult task. Uh, you need to pick your fights and you need to pick them wisely. Um, we eventually ended up selling it to Nedbank, sold it to Richard when I was still a pick and pay. Um, so we do provide value added services in financial services, but it is now in conjunction with the financial institutions because we learned one thing. Our customers did love us and, uh, they did know that occasionally we would get things wrong and they could come back and let us know. So when it came to giving, when it came to them giving us their money, it was a bit of a bridge to cross for customers in their own heads. So value added services is a very important part of the business for us today. And uh, that will grow, but it will grow in conjunction with the institutions. And it's, it's interesting that you, you spoke about how it was when Raymond Ackerman was really at the top of his game. He was also very involved in South Africa. He was, a, he was an outspoken critic in the political field. Are you going to go there? Are you going there? You know, I think, Alec, there's so many critics today um, in this field and space. And, I mean, it was just great to hear the speakers earlier today, and I look forward to listening to the speakers tomorrow. Um, we live, I mean, we, we, we live in this crazy situation currently that one only has to look around to see the devastation of what has been inflicted upon this country in the last years. Now, talk about every country has a clock of history. And if you think about, for me, when I define and I think about the clock of history and I think about countries like Korea that at the end of the Korean War that we kind of decimated, you think of Japan at the end of the Second World War. You think of Germany at the end of the Second World War. And then uh, here we are going on 30 years after our clock of history started. And we ask, well, where are we? And when you look at those countries 30 years as those cataclysmic events that define them, and we ask where we are, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm just devastated still by the level of almost internecine behavior that takes place in this country. And... Uh, the consequences are serious. The consequences are dire. And, you know, I look at this extraordinary talent that we had talking in this room here today, and I just cannot help but be saddened to a degree that there cannot be a greater degree of unity because it's kind of like tug of war. And, you know, there's so many times in our lives where you end up on the other side and it feels like we're on the other side of the rope, but we're actually not. We're actually on the same side of the rope. But we're so busy trying to pull it different directions that we actually feel that we're pulling against each other. We're not. So, you know, my appeal in this country is that we need to get past slogans and insults and verbal abuse and all of this stuff. Let's just get down to the facts. Let's just get down to the detail and let's work out how we get it done. Because, you know, when you talk about this extraordinary country that we live in, and I mean, when I left the campaign in 2009, we basically, we emigrated to the UK and we've been living backwards and forwards between the two. And I'll share a story with you. Gus back to Steenberg in my old life, and I did used to play a bit of golf. 
I was playing one day and there was a youngster in his mid thirties playing with us. And after a while he said to me, he said, Sean, do you mind if I'm a little bit impertinent and ask you personal favors? So I said, sure. So he says, you know, my wife and I are having a lot of discussions at the moment about what we do. You know, I've got a boy and a girl and this and that, and we don't know whether we should go to England, stay this. So I asked him a few questions about his personal life and stuff. And I said, you know, it's different for everybody. And I said, my advice is always consistent that I give to anybody that asks me this question. You need to strike a balance sheet. And what is a balance sheet? He's a CA by training. He's a smart kid. I said, strike a balance sheet for you. Draw up the list of the assets and liabilities for South Africa. I said, I'll help you, but, you know, get to the, the liability side here. You know, it's obviously security is number one. Put that down straight away. And then you've got currency exposure, currency risk number two. Is this going to become like a Zim dollar? And I said, put it down. And then I said, you've got some visual degradation. You're going to ride around. You're going to see homelessness, bit of potholes, all of that sort of stuff. Put it down. I said, okay, uh, I can't help you with the rest. You need to do that yourself. I think you're going to struggle. And then I said, when you get to the other side, you know, wherever it is, hey, you want to go to England. So I said, put down the assets and liabilities there. And I said, I can help you a bit there as well. So I said, your home here, that you live in Constantia, you've got this wonderful home in Constantia. I said, what do you need to do? You need to sell your home in Constantia, move to like the bottom end of Ronda Bosch there, get a nice little townhouse. And he kind of looks at me like this. So I said, no, no, hang on. Said, move down there, get a nice little townhouse there. And uh, yeah, then you can schlep all your money overseas. Because I said, it's a lot easier to make 20 rand here, was 20 in those days. It's a lot easier to make 20 rand here net than it is to make a pound in the United Kingdom. I can guarantee you that. And uh, and I said, you know, as for your kids, I mean, I'd leave your boy in Bishops, and I'd leave your girl in Herschel. Because I'm going to ask you the question in the UK, where do you intend living? So I said, take whatever it is that you got here. I don't need to know. Divide it by 20. And I think if you're lucky, you'll be living in Putney, in a cupboard. So that little house in Rondebosch, I think is looking pretty cool at this stage of the game. And uh, as for your kids, I don't know where they're going to school, but school is extensive there. And uh, I don't think they're going to get the education they're going to get at Bishops and Herschel. So... You know, then when they get to college age and they can study and they can go to uni, you know, if they're that smart, they can go to MIT or St. Andrews or whatever. So after a while, I said to him, I think, I think you want to leave. It's not about the kids. I said, if you were a really dedicated parent, there's nowhere in the world that you can raise children better than you can raise them here. I said, your kids will be more socially aware. They will be more morally aware. They'll be more ethically adjusted. They will be more fit for life than there will ever be where you're going to go, my friend, ever. And, listen. and you know, that's why when you, when, you, when you look at this country, it is, it's extraordinary. It's beautiful. And you come back here and there's a place. You know, I've got a group of people in, in COVID. Um, we bought a business in America when I was uh, helping with mattress firm that we bought a big uh, bed manufacturing business. And, during COVID, the one day I get a call from Leon Alman and he says to me, Sean, what's happening there in Cape Town with COVID? So I said, nothing. There's no cars on the road. We're in a hard lockdown. Anyway, long story short, we started this group of 20 people. And um, it ended up, we, every Sunday night, we were on Zoom, which was actually quite a help during COVID because nobody knew what was going on. So we had people like one or two from here and then from Israel, from Europe, from London, and then San Diego, Miami, all over the show. So it was good, good network connection. And in the group when we were talking, when they were having the riots here in Natal, and we were having all of that unseemly stuff going on, obviously all being ex-South Africans living overseas, they're all, you know, not dee -dee 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 on the thing. And uh, they say, but Sean, you know, why are you so quiet? So I said, no, no, I'm listening to you fellows now. You're like, you know, you're washing your souls now. This is now why you're moved overseas in case there's a riot. In the towel. It's uh, then said that, yeah, but look at this, look at that. I said, you know something? You need to understand this when you look at this country, okay? The solutions to this country live here. I said, those that can really truly leave have left. I said, all of the skills, all of the energy, all of the money, all of the knowledge, it's all here. We've got generations of people. I mean, if you look at the Afrikaans people that have been here, the Dutch founders that came here, the French people that came here, they've got 400 years of history in this country. This is their country. There is nowhere for them to go. 
There is nowhere for them to go. This is their country and they love it and they are committed to it. So how it is that we can somehow get clarity of purpose, clarity of leadership. And that's why when I listen to a guy like Moosey talk this afternoon, you know, these kind of people give me absolute belief and inspiration for the future. But it's how we cut through the clutter, stop this internecine bullshit, and actually get on with it. Because we are failing our people. We're failing our people in this country. That's the tragedy. And the people that we are failing is not us. We're all fine. Okay, it's the people that you drive past on the way in here. It's the tens of thousands that come to work every single solitary day and pick and pay. Those are the people that we are failing in this country. And those are the people that we owe a duty to, to get this stuff sorted out. You said earlier, You said earlier there are 90,000 people who work at Pick and Pay. Yeah. They would presumably have voter age dependents, a lot of them. Yes. So let's just say, just on average, you're probably talking at least half a million people who are associated. What are you doing to get them to go and actually cast their vote and not be part of those 14 million that uh, Herman was talking about earlier? who don't bother to vote. We have appealed upon everybody in the company to register, given time off to register to go and vote, but we do not get obviously involved in any way, shape or form in terms of direction, directioning or guidance. People need to vote their conscience. You know, people need to make their vote count. Um, so that's what we're doing as a company, is getting people, well, too late now, but to have registered to go and vote. There are a lot of people in this room who I know the, the, our tribe, mostly business owners, um, not always corporates, more independent businesses. And maybe they're so busy they haven't even been thinking about this. What would your recommendation be to everyone in this room to help achieve that objective that you're talking about, that if we want change, well, how are we going to get it? So now I'm going to contradict myself. I think when you have a look, you know, they said that the three crimes against humanity of the last century were fascism, socialism, and apartheid. I think that the first crime against this people of this century is unfortunately the current leadership in this country. And why do I say that? I think that there's one noble, almighty organization called the African National Congress will be judged in biblical terms. And why do I say biblical terms? Because there will be an Old Testament that will judge them favorably, that will judge their founding fathers favorably for what they believed in, for what they stood for, for what they suffered, for what they endured to get the country to the stage that they got it to. But tragically, post the mid-90s, they're going to be judged in the New Testament. And the New Testament will not judge them kindly. And history will judge because history was judge, judges with the benefit of hindsight. So that's why I say they will be judged in biblical terms. Old Testament good, New Testament bad. Short Summers, the CEO of Thick and Pay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.